And my material is not copyrighted. You can use mine any way you want. If you want to get any of my video materials, they're not copyrighted. Then they're going to tell the students, one of the evidences for evolution is embryology. Hi again, Kent. It's weird. I feel like I just saw you. Our visits aren't separated by any major life events or six months this time. It's, it's really unexpected. Anyway, embryology isn't an evidence. It's a branch of biology that's provided some evidences. But here are some informations for you, Kent. And I only mention this because, for some reason, creationists are still using this word, evidences. Uncountable nouns don't require pluralization. And when you pluralize them, it really displays your lack of comprehensions of the grammars. If you don't get that, my advices for you are to withdraw some monies, pack your luggages with some clothings, move back to your hometown, go back to your elementary school, and get some more educations about grammars. And while you're at it, evolutions, too. Ernst Haeckel, an embryology professor at University of Jena in Germany, loved evolution theory. When the Darwin's book came out, Ernst Haeckel read that book the next year and said, wow, this is a great theory. All we need now is some evidence. That's odd. I could have sworn that was a quote from one of you guys a couple thousand years after the Bible came out. And yeah, that's right. The only response I can actually be bothered to make is, no, uh you! Because your claim is somehow inferior even to what I thought was the lowest of the low form of argument, the quote mine, given that there's no quote and because the hundreds of pages of Origin of Species aren't just filled with obsessive repetitions of evolution trudeau, but actual descriptions of existing evidence, which means that your claim that there was no evidence is an outright lie. So, like I said, Nuh uh you! Nine years later, they still had no evidence. So Ernst Haeckel decided to help Charlie out. He was an embryology professor at the study of am animals before they're born, you know, the different embryos of all these different animals. He, took, he made drawings that were fake to make them look alike. So your point is that some guy like 150 years ago was dishonest and therefore modern biology is shit. I thought from the last video that you'd updated yourself to relying on 60-year-old science, but I guess you're not maintaining that high standard anymore. Was it just too scary up there so close to the light of relevancy, or...? The students are taught we have evidence from development. I don't think so. Ah, oh, fuck! Kent Hovind doesn't think so? Okay guys, put away your microscopes and all that shit. Kent doesn't think you're gonna find anything. Just write down that God done it, and let's all go hit the pub. I feel like I've used that joke before, but, um... If you're not going to put in effort, why should I bother? Darwin considered this by far the strongest single class of evidence in favor, a class of facts in favor of his theory. Okay. Kind of funny you had to quote the creationist book, Icons of Evolution, for that. I mean, wouldn't it be a lot more convincing if you quoted Darwin himself? Anyway, it seems like we're getting into Haeckel territory here. So I just want to be clear in advance that embryology, even in Darwin's time, is not synonymous with Haeckel or Haeckel's drawings. I know that's an obvious thing to say, but I get the impression that creationists don't find it quite so obvious. But whatever, it doesn't matter, because you're talking about the scientific opinions of 150 years ago, as though they're relevant to modern science. I'm really starting to wonder if I should just put a blanket ban on addressing any point that's been obsolete for over 100 years. Keep it within at least, say, the 20th century. But then, of course, this series would be about half as long, so I guess I'm just going to have to push forward. This textbook says, the human embryo growing in the mother has gills like a fish. No, it doesn't. Here's a better quality version of the image so that it's actually readable. And my audience, being readers, will quickly notice that it says human embryos have gill pouches in common with reptile embryos, and that this is a fish-like feature. These features are also known as pharyngeal pouches, but they're referred to as gill pouches just because they're homologous features to those that develop very visibly into gills in fish, although they develop into other parts in mammals and reptiles. I really can't believe I actually have to explain this to a guy who claims to have spent lots of time reading science textbooks and 15 years teaching science. When I get bored, which isn't too often around our place, I just read science books. I like science. I taught it for 15 years. Even though I'm not teaching it anymore, I still like the study. It's so many neat things to learn. But pharyngeal pouches aren't gills. They're a feature common to reptile, mammal, bird, and fish embryos, and they have nothing whatsoever to do with respiration. They're just little indents on the inside of the body between the pharyngeal arches, as opposed to the pharyngeal grooves or clefts or folds, which are in the same place but on the outside of the body, and they're what people are usually referring to when they talk about the gill slits. And those slits are divided up by the pharyngeal arches in between. In fish, the pouches and the grooves join up, and some of the pharyngeal arches develop into gill arches to support gills. In mammals and reptiles and birds, they don't. But I'm on a tangent again. My point is that the pouches aren't gills. 
but they are a feature that's common to all chordates and their existence is an objective fact. Those little folds of skin are not gills, okay? Excuse me? Those little folds of skin are not folds of skin. You make it sound like they're just some unfortunately prominent wrinkles. And yeah, like I said, they're not gills, and the book didn't say they're gills either, so... Those little wrinkles under your chin when you're growing up later develop into bones in the ear and glands in the throat. Right, which is why I thought it was just a little bit odd to describe them as folds of skin. But whatever. They never have anything to do with breathing. Breaking news! Humans don't breathe with gills! Jesus fucking Christ. I've seen folks that have five or six chins, and they can't breathe through any of them but the top one. <laughs> Those are not gill slits. So human embryos don't have gill slits because fat people can't breathe through their multiple chins. Fantastic argument. Thanks, Kent. <sighs> Look, I know that was supposed to be a joke, but the ignorance required for anyone to find that funny is just... Wait, did you just conflate gills with gill slits? Hagel took a drawing of a dog and a human embryo and he changed them to make them look exactly alike. His fake drawings looked almost identical. On top are the real drawings, underneath are Haeckel's fake drawings. He lied, folks, intentionally. As I said earlier, this argument breaks down to a man lied in the 1860s, and therefore biology in 2016 is stupid. Good one, Kent. You really nailed it there. I really shouldn't bother to debunk this claim in any more detail, because once I've shown that it's based on irredeemably stupid logic, which I have, then the rest of it doesn't matter. And I don't even care to defend Haeckel here, although I'm far from convinced that he was intentionally lying. He can defend himself, although I hear he's been fairly quiet these days. But the document that I've linked in the description called Pictures of Evolution and Charges of Fraud is kind of an interesting read on that subject. Although, of course, the only claim that it's relevant to is the one that Haeckel committed fraud in order to support his recapitulation theory. And it has no relevance whatsoever to our topic, which is modern evolutionary theory. It doesn't really even have much relevance to embryology, either past or present, considering that Haeckel is not the dictator of embryology, and it has no relevance to the other people who were studying or drawing embryos around the time of Haeckel, or any time before or since. But interesting. And um, I've debunked this claim before, way back in 2012, in Hello I'm a Scientist 6, and I decided to check my debunk there to see what I did. And apparently, back then, I agreed with myself now, in that this claim doesn't need any further debunking. Maybe his drawings are inaccurate. Maybe he misinterpreted some things. Who knows? That's beside the point. Because scientists from 100 years ago don't define science today. But whatever. For our purposes, he was a liar. Now what? The point you're trying to make, I think, is that drawings don't prove common descent. And they don't demonstrate that there are similarities between different kinds of embryos. Fair enough. Do you remember what we discussed in episode 3? John, didn't we already discuss the fact that artist representations are not science? We talked about this in the last video. We've talked about this in this video. When the fuck are you going to drop this? Now granted, these drawings carry a little more weight because they're actually drawn by a scientist who is studying embryos. But the point is, if a hundred year old drawing is inaccurate, it doesn't disprove embryology. I hate to burst your bubble. Wow, that was some confusing Inception type shit. I hope I'm still in real life. Kind of wish I brought my totem. Wait, why am I in a vortex? He made huge charts of his posters of his drawings of these embryos and traveled all over Germany and just about by himself converted the Germans to believing in evolution. Which later led to the obvious question, well, if evolution is true, then maybe one of the races of people has developed farther than the rest. And then whoever asked the obvious question felt really, really stupid once they realized that all humans have developed equally far that distance being from the origin of life to now. Which, by the way, is a subtitle to Charlie Darwin's book. You can look at it for yourself. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. See, Darwin was a racist. A man was a racist in the 1850s. Therefore, evolution is evil. And therefore, evolution doesn't happen. You're on fire today, Kent! Where's the next clip? Seriously, you want me to explain what favored races means? Didn't I just do that like three years ago? Lazy sons of bitches can go look it up themselves. Okay, there's no way I'm putting four fucking minutes of old content debunking a Kenthoven impersonator in the middle of my Kenthoven debunk. Fuck's sake, fine, I'll put it up as a classic logic. You happy? Okay, people, go watch the classic logic clip I linked in the description while you weren't looking. I'll wait. Everyone back? Alright, 
So it should be really clear from that clip that the word race just did not mean the same thing back then that it means today. I mean, as far as I know, there's no human race that anyone calls cabbage. And yet the flaw with this argument goes even deeper than that, because even if we erroneously apply the modern definition of that word to origin of species, the subtitle still isn't racist. The preservation of the favored races. Favored, of course, by a slightly anthropomorphized natural selection. Now, all of the races of humans that currently exist have been preserved until now. All current races are favored by natural selection, so I'm really not seeing the objection. And even if for some reason all the black people died off over the next thousand years or something, due to, say, a new natural disease that for some reason is way worse for people with more melanin, how would it be racist to say that they were not favored by natural selection? I mean, it's an unfortunate fact, but unfortunate facts are facts just the same. Reality isn't racist. So no matter how freely I misinterpret this title to try to understand your point, it doesn't contain even the slightest hint of racism. With that said, Darwin probably was a bit of a racist. He lived in the 19th century, for fuck's sake. On top are Haeckel's fake drawings. Underneath are actual photographs of what he claimed he was drawing a picture of. Now, either he's a lousy artist, or he's a liar. I kind of thought that in this scenario, the apologists preferred the false trichotomy as opposed to the false dichotomy. What I mean is, shouldn't the choice be between lousy artist, liar, and lunatic? You're a 